This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Wall Street rallies, and it has Greece to thank, as stocks post their best three-day rally since February. Fragile deal, Greece and its creditors may have reached an agreement, but did it come at a price too steep? And did Germany's demands go too far? Drowning in debt, the one thing millennials have now that earlier generations did not, massive amounts of debt. Tonight, we start a three-part series called Millennials and Money on Nightly Business Report for Monday, July 13th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. A deal in Greece, stability in China, and a stock market rally here on Wall Street. Investors breathed a sigh of relief when they woke up this morning to word that Greece and its creditors have reached a deal on a fresh bailout. Now, this deal takes the worst-case scenario off the table and eases the fear that the country will leave the currency union in Europe in the near term. That was enough to allow investors in Europe and the U.S. to vote with their wallets and send stocks <laughs> higher. By the close, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 217 points to finish at 17,977. NASDAQ gained 73. The S&P 500 added 23 points. But despite the deal between Greece and its creditors, there are still a number of uncertainties surrounding the country's long-term financial fate. And this deal came at a very high price, including tough conditions that no one is sure the country's leaders can actually fulfill. Michelle Caruso Cabrera reports tonight from Athens. Greece is still in the Eurozone, but just barely. After an all-night negotiating session in Brussels, the country emerged with an even worse deal than the one Greek voters rejected a little more than a week ago. Pension reform, which will force Greeks to retire later and contribute more to their retirement. Higher sales taxes on many products. Reforms to the labor markets and product markets. And a brand new requirement. Greece must transfer ownership of 50 billion worth of state assets to an independent fund. Those assets will be sold over time to help recapitalize Greece's creaking banks and to pay back some of what Greek owes to the rest of Europe. Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras told reporters the deal will persuade markets that Grexit is no longer an option. But before Greece gets any new money, Tsipras and the Greek parliament must pass and implement pension and tax reform in the next 48 hours. Only then will finance ministers meet to begin the process of creating a full bailout program. And the situation in Greece is dire. The Eurozone estimates the country will need more than 80 billion euros in support over the next three years. That's on top of the 240 billion they've already been awarded in two previous bailouts. Hence why other leaders want proof of performance first. A lot of that trust was lost and it had to be rebuilt. It has, still has to be rebuilt. The most immediate question on the minds of Greek citizens and businesses, when can the banks reopen? The answer, likely not until they get a fresh round of investment, billions of euros worth, to recapitalize them. That's likely not going to happen until the deal is finalized. And the Dutch finance minister said today that's going to take at least a month. Greece still has a very tough road ahead. For Nightly Business Report, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, Athens. Greece owes Germany the most amount of money of any country in the Eurozone, and that partially explains why Germany was flexing its muscles throughout the talks and didn't back down during the marathon negotiations over this past weekend. But as Steve Leisman tells us from Berlin, many critics say Germany went too far. If it wasn't clear already that German Chancellor Angela Merkel had claimed the title Iron Lady of Europe for Margaret Thatcher, the weekend's hardline negotiations with Greece left no doubt. She went into the talks demanding Greece either agree to severe economic reforms or leave the euro common currency, and that Greece act first. And she won. This whole paper has to be adopted by the Greek Parliament uh, by Wednesday before we can actually task our parliaments to look at the matter. But the question is whether Merkel went too far. Criticism of the deal exploded in social media with the hashtag, this is a coup, used hundreds of thousands of times across Europe and the U.S. Some said that Merkel undermined decades of trust built up across Europe, especially by threatening a Grexit. I am accusing the Chancellor that she, Mr. Schäuble, 
and Mr. Gabriel created a dangerous situation by floating the idea of a temporary Grexit. But Merkel has shown in her 10 years in office that her ear for domestic German politics is finely tuned. Not one cent more, screamed the cover of the conservative Focus magazine this weekend. We pay, we pay, we pay, and they do nothing. If the Greek parliament and prime minister can deliver, the deal Merkel crafted virtually guarantees that the German parliament, to be hauled back this Friday from their summer vacations, will reluctantly support tens of billions of euros more in aid for Greece. If it all works out despite the criticism, if Greece and the Eurozone are saved intact, and if Merkel can maintain her domestic popularity, then the new Iron Lady of Europe will surely have proven her mettle. For Nightly Business Report in Berlin, I'm Steve Leisman. And investors could wake up to another deal tomorrow morning if late-day reports are correct. NBC News and the Associated Press are reporting that there are indications a nuclear deal between Iran and world powers is coming together and could be announced overnight. The oil markets are paying very close attention because an agreement could potentially lift Western sanctions on Iranian crude exports. Today, the price of West Texas crude settled down 1 percent to $52.20 a barrel. And the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, is raising its forecast now for global demand growth this year. In its monthly report, the cartel also said it expects demand growth in 2016 as well. OPEC also said it anticipates that the market will become more balanced next year as China uses more oil and the supply from the North American shale deposits grows more slowly. Meantime, the average price of gasoline has dropped two cents over the past two weeks to a national average of $2.83 a gallon, according to the Lundberg survey. But don't tell that to Californians. Gas prices in that state are spiking, despite the overall downward trend. Jane Wells in Los Angeles explains why. Gas prices in California are closing in on $5 a gallon. Again, here it's $4.95. In some places, it has top $5 a gallon. This, it isn't even over yet, they're telling us. Prices on average on Friday were $3.66 a gallon, according to Gas Buddy. They're now $4.08 a gallon, though I can't find it that cheap anywhere. That's an 11% change in one weekend, and we are expecting to see them go higher this week. What's the deal? Well, nobody is sending their oil to California. It's just not worth it on the forward pricing until now. And we can't make enough of our own. Inventories are at a troubling level, according to Tom Closa at Oil Price Information Services. Plus, there are refinery issues to make California's special blend of gas. And ExxonMobil refinery is still recovering from a February explosion. Spot prices have tripled from their lows last winter. Closa says he's never seen a six-month swing like that. What will happen next? Well, there are two ships, only two, bringing oil to California right now. It takes about three weeks to get through the refining process. The high prices we're seeing now will encourage others to begin shipping their oil here, bringing it into the state. Closa says we should see prices start to drop anywhere between five days and five weeks. And in five months, California gas prices should be a dollar lower than they are now, though still higher than the national average. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jane Wells in Los Angeles. Wow. Well, regulators say there is no single reason why the Treasury market was hit with extreme volatility last October. In a joint report issued between the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, and other agencies, a number of factors were cited that may have contributed to the so-called bond market flash crash, including the growing role of high-frequency trading. Peculiar moves in the bond market are closely watched because bonds are perceived as safer than stocks and other investments. Today, the yield on the 10-year Treasury rose above 2.4 percent. And from bonds to stocks, earnings season starts in earnest tomorrow, and investors will be watching what many of the big-name companies say. But their results and their forecasts come at a time when many of their stock prices have fallen sharply from their highs, despite the recent market upswing. Dominic Chu takes a look at why investors are approaching this earnings season with caution. There's a reason why many investors are still scared about what's happening in the U.S. stock market. Sure, it looks like the problems in Greece have calmed down for now, as have the concerns over the Chinese market. Even though we managed to bounce after a recent pullback, an increasing number of individual stocks are still showing signs of weakness. Over half the members of the large cap Russell 1000 index have fallen by 10 percent or more since highs over the last year. That means over 500 larger cap stocks are in correction or even bear market territory. Among them are companies like railroad operator CSX. 
computer chip giant Intel, and oil services giant Schlumberger. All three of those companies are slated to report earnings later on this week. And some experts think that there's a reason to proceed with caution. Given that earnings growth this year is ex expected to be a more muted, uh, anywhere from zero to 2% right now, that would also point to more muted stock market returns over the next uh, six to 18 months. Not everyone is as pessimistic about corporate earnings growth. And the overall picture for U.S. stocks could be helped along by a sense that America is a safer market to be in, at least on a relative basis. There are two key reasons why the market's likely to do well in the next uh, six to 12 months. The first one is that earnings are poised to surprise to the upside, to come in better than expectations. And the second one is as the Fed renormalizes rates, it should actually convince investors that business conditions are renormalizing as well, which should be a big positive. Ultimately, it's going to be more of a balancing act for investor portfolios and about evaluating risk tolerances in the context of an overall financial plan. Still, with as many stocks as there are in relative down trends, caution is going to be an investing theme going forward, especially with earnings season getting into full force this week. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. Still ahead, the nation's largest cable company is doing something no cable company has done before. But will it win over the cord cutters? The nation's largest cable operator, Comcast, is looking to cash in on cord cutters. The company is offering its own streaming service for its broadband customers. Unlike other services like Netflix, the new venture is being offered by a mainstream cable company, and that's an important sign for a rapidly changing industry. Julia Borston takes a look. With Comcast shares trading at a 52-week high, the nation's largest cable operator is looking to cash in on demand for alternatives to cable. With Comcast Stream, a new internet-delivered TV bundle for broadband-only subscribers. I think it comes down to, you know, being proactive and kind of somewhat um, defensive in the face of competition from online video offerings. For $15 a month, Comcast Xfinity Internet customers can add on a bundle of broadcast networks plus HBO and a cloud DVR. Unlike traditional cable bundles, there are no commitments, equipment or fees. Users can just sign up and download the app. Comcast's new app is launching in Boston, Chicago and Seattle this year before rolling out to Comcast's entire footprint in 2016. This puts Comcast into direct competition with Dish's Sling TV as well as Verizon's Slim Down Bundle. There is something to be said about the scale that Comcast offers on, on the broadband side. So definitely I think that will play in their favor um, and also the ability to, I think, quickly ramp up the content offerings will be an, a, another potential advantage over time, given the breadth and depth of the relationships that Comcast has. But Comcast's new service is limited, and not just because it's not including any cable channels other than HBO. Subscribers won't be able to stream directly to their TV sets, and they can only stream to their other devices within their homes. And then there's the question of whether this new service could steal customers from Comcast's bigger, higher-cost bundle, an issue Amobi says the company is clearly watching as it carefully rolls out this new offering. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borges in Los Angeles. And Comcast is the parent company of CNBC, which produces this program. And we begin tonight's market focus with a nearly $16 billion energy deal. Marathon Petroleum's Master Limited Partnership will merge with Mark West Energy Partners in a cash and stock deal. Mark West splits natural gas into other fuels. The combined company will have a market cap of more than $20 billion. Bucks. Marathon popped nearly 8% to 5878. Mark West Energy surged almost 14% to 6809. Depomed announcing today that it has taken steps to defend itself from a hostile takeover about a week after Horizon Pharma went public with its nearly $2 billion buyout plan. According to a filing, Depomed adopted a shareholder rights plan that would be triggered if a group or person takes more than a 10% stake in the firm. 
Depomed was 1% higher to $30.51. Horizon Pharma fell nearly 3%. It closed at $34.97. Consumer products company Jarden Corp has reached an agreement to buy the privately held disposable dinnerware company Waddington Group. The nearly $1.5 billion deal will buy a lot of plastic forks. It's expected to expand Jarden's product offerings. It already owns brands like Crock-Pot and Yankee Candle. Shares rose almost 5% to $54.78. Well, the fight for retail domination just escalated. Last week, we told you Amazon will host a huge sale called Prime Day, similar to Black Friday. Well, today, Walmart said it will launch a rival sale on Wednesday. Walmart rose 1 percent to 73.88. Amazon was up almost 3 percent to 455.57. U.S. antitrust regulators are looking into Apple's new streaming music service. That's according to a Reuters report. Apple takes a 30 percent cut of an all-in app purchase for digital goods. And some streaming companies are complaining that Apple's cuts force them to charge more in the app store, therefore eroding their profit margins. Still, Apple was about 2 percent higher to close at 125.60. Starbucks is leading a multi-company initiative to hire 100,000 young, low-income minority workers over the next three years. Other companies involved include Alaska Air, CVS Health, Microsoft and Walmart. Starbucks says that while some new hires will replace employees who leave, the majority will be new entry-level positions. The stock rose 2 percent to 55.70. America, in case you haven't noticed, is getting older. In fact, within two decades, people over age 65 will outnumber those under 18. This will not only change the face of America, but will strain family finances, a topic that was discussed today at the 2015 White House Conference on Aging. In his speech, President Obama says saving for retirement has become increasingly difficult for many Americans. There are a lot of folks out here who work really, really hard. But at the end of the day, just still don't have enough of a nest egg. In today's economy, preparing for retirement has gotten tougher. Here to discuss how families and the financial services firms that serve them need to adapt is Andrew Sieg. He's head of Global Wealth and Retirement Solutions at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Andy, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, hey, you know, Thank you. it used to be that people lived 12, maybe 15 years in retirement, and now increasingly, they're living 20, 25, even 30 years in retirement. That's a big savings gap. How do you suggest that people make up for it? Well, it's a big savings gap. And by the way, Tyler, that's why today's conference at the White House was so well-timed, actually. Uh, this is a moment that we need to think about a framework to support the aging of the baby boomers. 10,000 baby boomers a day are reaching age 65. They've got a lot of topics they need to think about. Money is certainly one of them, but they're also, families look very different today than they have in the past. People are making decisions about when to leave work, when to potentially go back to work. Um, and uh, health care looms extremely large for most families because uh, a bout with long-term care could drain everyone's piggy bank, essentially. You know, the other issue, Andrew, is that a lot of people feel that there's no way they can save enough for retirement, so increasingly they just don't save. Or they're trying to pay the bills that they have to pay now. Well, I, I think, Sue, so. your, your point's exactly right. It is critical that workers get involved in workplace savings programs very early in their career. The best way to save is to do it uh, in an automatic way, mm -hmm. uh, signing up for a 401k plan, for example. If there are millennials who are watching tonight, for a millennial, paying down your student debt and getting out from underneath it as quickly as possible, that's a version of saving. And I would argue, by the way, that investments in education, in human capital, are a form of saving as well. And for those who are in retirement, we're seeing a very strong trend that work does not, begin, uh, does not end at age 65. Many, many Americans are looking at work today as something that's going to stretch on uh, into their late 60s and into their 70s. And it's something that they want to do, frankly, not something that they're being forced to do financially. One we of, view that as, po as positive news. One of the things that many families, including my own, have faced uh, in recent years, and I know that you uh, and the financial services industry more broadly are, are contending with, is the decline in cognitive ability that accompanies aging, which makes decision making tougher. It, uh, it, it means that you really have to be very careful in your planning and the setting up of trusts. What do you recommend to families there? Well, Tyler, great question, because if you look at Americans over age 85, 
45 to 50 percent are suffering from Alzheimer's or another form of cognitive decline, dementia, and so on. So this is a key topic. First thing that needs to happen, families need to talk about these topics. In many cases, uh, Alzheimer's or another situation thrusts itself upon a family and they're really not prepared. You need to think clearly about how financial decision making is going to pass uh, from one family member to another. Uh, from a, the perspective of financial services firms, we're doing a lot to try to better train advisors and to work with regulators about how to handle um, all of the topics that flow from cognitive decline. But as you can imagine, there are concerns that clients have around privacy, and we're all in a much better position if families have spoken early and often if couples have discussed how they're going to mm -hmm. essentially have a living will for their finances. Very good advice, uh, Andrew Sieg. We appreciate it. Andy is with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And coming up, Andy just mentioned the millennials, and they are a growing influence. And today, they make up the largest portion of U.S. workers. But there is one thing that sets this generation apart. The first part of our series, Millennials and Money, is next. Here is what to watch tomorrow, folks. Earnings from Dow Components, Johnson & Johnson, and J.P. Morgan. They'll be at the top of a long parade. Retail sales are out, an important gauge of consumer spending. Also on the data front, import and export prices. As a read on business inventories and that, folks, what to watch Tuesday. Union officials and Detroit's auto executives began contract talks today. General Motors CEO Mary Barra kicked things off with bargaining that will determine labor costs for Detroit's big three and the nearly 140,000 factory workers at those firms. The issues that they will be hammering out include health care, pensions, and whether to restructure the current two-tier wage system. Airlines collected a record amount of money from extra fees last year. Revenue from check bags, changed reservations, and a host of other add-ons jumped about 20 percent to an all-time high. Are you ready for this? $38 billion. This according to a study by IdeaWorks uh, company and Car Trawler. Uh, the companies that collected the most, United, followed by American, U.S. Airways, and Delta. The nation's largest public pension fund fell just short of its annual return target. This is CalPERS. The California Public Employees Retirement System deals with a slowdown in the markets and weak private equity returns. Nonetheless, its three- and five-year targets far exceeded expectations. CalPERS is an important bellwether for how other large pensions will perform across the country. And now to those millennials, those folks born in the early 1980s through the early 2000s tonight. We start a three-part series looking at this generation. Millennials currently make up the largest portion of U.S. workers, by the way, and some estimates say they will make up half of the workforce in the next five years. And by that time, they're expected to spend nearly a trillion and a half dollars a year. But right now, as Sharon Epperson tells us, this group is saddled with massive amounts of debt. 27-year-old Brandon Will is no stranger to debt. I have debt both from college, student loans, and I have some credit card debts. Like many in his generation, he had to borrow money to finance his college education. The average millennial in their early 20s has about $13,000 in debt. By their late 20s, that figure nearly triples to $47,000. And the overall debt load for older millennials in their early 30s jumps to almost $70,000, according to data from iQuantify. Financial advisor Douglas Bonaparte says the ramifications of student debt are far-reaching. It's saddling a generation, and particularly the uh, older end of the gener generation. The growth in student loans for this age group is crowding out other types of debt, according to research from TransUnion. In the last decade, the different types of loans that people carry has changed significantly, especially for younger borrowers, largely due to student debt. Ten years ago, student loan debt accounted for about 13 percent of total debt for young adults ages 20 to 29. By the end of last year, it had jumped to 37 percent for that age group. I do feel like my debt sets me back in the grand scheme of things as far as, you know, buying a home or whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, I think it is a priority to get this stuff taken care of now. Many borrowers are unaware of several options to help them pay off their loans. 
like income-based repayment plans, which calculate a borrower's monthly loan payment based on their salary. But Bonaparte says while these plans can help free up cash flow, borrowers may take longer to pay off student debt. Negotiating for higher pay may be a better strategy. What could earning an extra $5,000 a year mean for a new grad today? That can add up to half a million dollars in extra earnings over the course of your lifetime. So it's far easier than cutting coupons or trying to budget. It's a really good way to impact your bottom line. With a new job, Brandon Will has been able to increase his monthly student loan payments. He's eager to move on to the next stage of his life, but he knows it will take time. Within the near future, I would like to have the student loans paid off. I'd definitely like to have the credit cards paid off and then be in a great position where in the near future I may be looking to, you know, buy a home, so focus on those other things as I further in my life. We'll see. We'll see what things happen. I don't know for sure. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sharon Epperson. Because of their massive debt levels, many millennials have become savers and are planning for the long term earlier than other generations. That's good, but there's one thing that's holding them back financially. Find out what it is tomorrow in the second part of our series, series Millennials and Money. Look forward to that They're very much. They're everywhere, these they, millennials. They are, They're all especially around, around here. here. Yeah. <laughs> that does it for Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for watching. And we like them. They're very nice. They're very nice. I'm Tyler Madsen. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.